Hey, AP Advanced Kids, Campbell here. In this video, I'm going to talk about Gauss's Law. Now, I love to do home improvement projects, and I will tell you there's an easy way to do things, and there's a hard way. Unfortunately, a lot of times I choose the hard way, but it's all about the tools we use, and the same thing applies here in physics. You just learn the hard way to do uh, electric field calculations, and for the shapes I showed you, unfortunately, you always got to go the hard way. But there are other shapes that we haven't talked about, like spheres or cylinders or plates of charge, where we can simplify by using this amazing tool called Gauss's Law. I love Gauss's Law. Gauss's Law allows us to calculate the electric field when there is symmetry. When I, If I look at something like a sphere, no matter which way I look at it, it's still a sphere. So this works well. So what we're going to do is we're going to create imaginary surfaces that are going to help us calculate our electric field. Now, an imaginary surface is just like when we have a massless rope or, or a pulley that has no friction or a surface that has no friction. It's kind of like the same thing. It's like a little physics fantasy land, but you will see mm, Gauss is amazing. So what we're going to be doing with Gauss's Law is Gauss's Law is about the relationship between the field at points on our imaginary surface and that the total charge that's enclosed by the surface through this idea called flux. What is flux? All right, so what electric flux is, is it's the flow of the electric field through a surface. Kind of like water flowing through a pipe. We have electric field moving uh, through a surface. Now, if we have positive flux, that means that we have an outward flow of electric field. So, for example, if I put an imaginary box around a positive charge and I took a little test charge and I moved it around outside the box, that if that test charge was a little positive charge, right, it's going to be pushing it away. Remember, electric field lines are set based off the way a positive charge would move. So if I have positive flux, that means that there is a positive charge enclosed by my imaginary box. If I have a negative flux, that means I have an inward flow of electric field. So if I took a little positive test charge and I moved it around my imaginary box, it would be pulled in towards the box. And if I have zero flux, well, there could be a couple scenarios here for zero flux. Zero flux means, one, I might not have any charge in the box. It's just an empty box. Sorry, no Christmas presents here. Or you could have two equal but opposite charges in your box, right? Then the outward flux would be canceled by the inward flux. Or maybe there is flux that's coming in and going out. So again, no charge in the box but maybe we have charge outside the box. And so we have flux going in and out. So the inward cancels the outward. So that's when zero flux are given. Now, flux is the rate of flow through an area or a volume. It is a dot product of the area and the vector field, the electric field. So electric flux, and there's actually different types of flux. We'll talk about magnetic flux when we're in magnetism, but the electric flux is the rate of flow of an electric field through an area. The symbol for flux is a phi, the capital phi. The sub E means this is electric flux. When we do magnetic flux, it'll be an M or a B, but we'll talk about that magnetism. It is equal to the electric field times the area, and it's a dot product, so we could also write this as E A cosine theta, right? Dot products are a cosine between the vector and our uh, area vector, our two vectors. So here is an example, and, and so this area vector, like what am I talking about for this angle, this cosine theta? we are that it's going to be the angle between the normal to the surface and the vector field. So for example, if if the here's the normal to the surface, right? Normal lines are always perpendicular to a surface and my electric field is traveling straight through 
that's going to give me the maximum amount of flux because that would be uh, E times A times the cosine of zero, which would be, you know, cosine zero is one. If the flux is traveling at some area, some angle through my imaginary surface, then my theta is going to be this. It's the angle between that area vector, which is drawn normal to the surface of the area, normal to the surface of the area, yeah, that I have flux going through, uh, to the electric field line. Um, and here is where I have zero flux because my angle is 90 degrees between the electric field and the perpendicular to the surface. Then I have zero flux because there's no flux traveling through the surface. Now, like I said, the area vector is normal to the surface. So it's not the angle between the surface and the electric field line. It's the angle to the perpendicular to the surface. Why? I don't know. So if we had a non-uniform electric field or our surface was not flat, then we would have to add up all the electric field over our area. And so we have a new little symbol here that you've never probably seen before. And it's, it's an integral symbol with a little circle on it. And what that means is it's a surface integral. So we're taking an integral over the surface. So we're not adding up like the whole stuff. It's just the stuff on the surface. So in the case where the flux is equal on the surface, um, then you would just take the electric field and multiply by the area of the surface. I will tell you, we are not going to have non-uniform electric fields. We are going to have symmetric shapes, like spheres, like cylinders, but so the area will be pretty straightforward. But don't worry about the whole electric field integral, surface integral. It's Gauss's law, it's great. So let's do some flux calculations. So the flux, the electric flux, is the electric field times the area. Why did I write dA? I don't know. Here, we'll make it all pretty. There we go. That's even prettier, right? Okay, the electric field is constant. So my flux is going to be the electric field, 2 times 10 to the third, times the area which this is a disk, right? So the area is going to be pi r squared, and uh, the r is 0.1 squared, so let's not forget that. And then uh, we have the dot product here, so we have a cosine between the normal to the surface and the electric field, so that would be the cosine of 30 degrees. Make sure you are in degrees and not radians. Uh, and so when we solve this, uh, you're going to get 50 Four, and flux is a newton meter squared over coulomb, right? Newton over coulomb is electric field, meter squared is the area. Now, what if I have a sphere? What if I make my imaginary surface be a sphere and I put it around this point charge Q? Well, my electric fields, right, our flux is the electric field dot dA. Again, electric field is going to be constant here, right, because I have this imaginary beautiful sphere that is symmetric and centered around that charge. So my electric field is 1 over 4 pi E naught, right, or K, Q over R whoops, sorry, r squared, the area of a sphere is 4 pi r squared. Now, I want you to notice something here. Um, the reason why I don't have to do the dot product is because my electric field lines, right, they radiate out symmetrically from my positive charge. And so the area vector and the sphere make an angle. The area vector, sorry, would be like this. Uh, and the sphere are, uh, the electric field lines have an angle of zero degrees. They are just parallel to each other. Um, now, pretty cool here. So that means my flux 
uh, we can get rid of an R squared. We can get rid of the 4 pi. So this is why they put the 4 pi, the 1 over 4 pi E naught on your equation sheet for Gauss in particular is Q over E naught. Hmm. Huh. Interesting. So the flux through this closed surface is Q divided by the constant E naught. Hmm. All right. Oops. Now, the number of field lines, like if we, if as long as we make a closed surface and we put it around this charge, I need a nice pretty sphere because, you know, spheres have a area that we know the equation of. But I could, I could put a sphere, I could put some weird morphy looking shape around it, doesn't matter. The net flux through any closed surface around this point charge is going to be the same because the field lines are the same whether the surface is spherical or not spherical as long as it's a closed surface. Therefore, the net flux surrounding this point charge for any closed surface is given by the Q, the charge that's enclosed in that surface over E naught, and it's independent of the shape of the surface. So electric flux is the surface integral of E dot dA, which is equal to the enclosed charge divided by E naught. Doesn't matter what the shape of the surface is, as long as it's closed. This turns out to be true for any charge distribution and any closed surface as long as it's symmetrical. So we can't do this for a line of charge. Line of charge, not symmetrical. So Gauss's law depends only on the enclosed charge. And this, this, this is Gauss's law right here, that the surface integral of E dot dA is equal to the, Q in, the charge enclosed, Q enclosed over E naught. And this is actually the first of Maxwell's equations. We're going to learn about Maxwell's equations at the very end of the second semester. And this is the very first one. Now, if there is a positive flux, that means there's a positive, that Q enclosed is positive. If there's a negative flux, there is a negative charge enclosed. And if there's zero flux, there is no net charge enclosed. It doesn't mean there isn't a charge. There's just no net charge enclosed. So the steps to applying Gauss's law is first to choose the appropriate imaginary surface. The things we can use Gauss's law for are spheres. So like a point charge here, a ball of charge, the Van de Graaff generator dome, and our imaginary surface would also be a sphere. So we would have a concentric sphere with our ball of charge either inside or outside, we could be inside as well, as long as we're using a spherical symmetry so that our R values are all the same. Or we could use a cylindrical symmetry. Symmetry. So like if we have a infinite line of charge, this wouldn't be true for a finite line of charge. We could not use this for a finite line of charge, but a long wire, we could use a cylinder for. And so here's my wire in this picture. Uh, and here's my uh, cylindrical symmetry. It's like a soup can with the, with the wire running through it. You'll notice that the electric field is all popping out of the can at an even distance away as long as it's symmetric with the line or the wire. Or we could use it for a plate of charge. So here's my plate of charge, but this time I'm going to orient my soup can or my tuna can in this case uh, in this direction so that the electric field is popping out of the ends, not popping out of the sides like it is if I'm doing a wire of charge. So those are the three cases that we will use Gauss's law for. Spheres, long lines of charge, infinite lines of charge like a wire, uh, and plates. So now what? Well, what we're going to do once we have, if we have one of these situations, we're going to draw our Gaussian surface, which is just a mathematical surface. It's just an imaginary surface. It's a massless rope. And it's going to reflect the symmetry about this charge distribution at a distance r from the center. So wherever they ask us to find the electric field for, that's where we're going to draw our Gaussian surface. Then we're going to use Gauss's law, which is, you know, the surface integral of E dot dA is equal to Q enclosed over E naught. That's kind of behind my little screen. Sorry about that. Okay, so 
In this video, I'm going to do this for a conducting sphere, and then I'm going to have separate videos for other scenarios because this video is already getting pretty long, isn't it? Okay, now, hold on, caution. Although the Q enclosed is the net charge in the surface, the electric field represents the total electric field. So if you have charges outside of the surface, then the total electric field is going to be a combination of the charges that are inside and outside. So in principle, we can use Gauss's law for symmetric charge distributions. Um, in practice, though, we want it to be completely symmetrical. So we don't want to have little charges outside of our Gaussian surface, like little point charges around. We'd want the Gaussian surface to be all around it if possible. Um, and again, spheres, infinite lines of charge or plates. We can't use Gauss's law for arcs, disks, or finite lines of charge. So the stuff we did in our rules for before, we still got to keep doing those. Okay, so let's look at a conducting sphere, and we're going to look at a distance r inside and a distance r outside. So um, in a conductor, the excess charge always resides on the surface of the conductor. And so the first thing I want to do is draw a Gaussian surface. So this is a sphere, so I can use Gauss's law. And I'm going to first look at this scenario where r is bigger than r. So I would make my Gaussian surface nice and symmetric at some distance r outside. And so Gauss's law is that the surface integral of E dot dA is equal to Q enclosed over E naught. Now a sphere um, is my Gaussian surface and that's what dA is. This is the area of my Gaussian surface. That's my imaginary surface. It is not, not the actual sphere itself. It is this wonderful, beautiful sphere that I have drawn and have in my head. Okay, now because this is all a distance R away, this isn't it beautifully symmetric with the ball of charge here, um, the electric field is gonna be constant at that point all along my Gaussian surface. It's all gonna be poking out perpendicular to the surface, beautiful. So I don't have to do any sort of integral. The area is the area of my Gaussian surface, which is a sphere. So that's four pi r squared. And this r is this r, not the radius of the sphere. It is the area of my Gaussian surface, which is at a distance of little r. That's equal to the Q enclosed. The enclosed charge is all that charge. So that's Q, according to this problem, divided by E naught which means that my electric field at a distance r greater than r is equal to q over 4 pi e naught r squared. Huh? What? Wait, isn't that the electric field for a point charge? It is. Notice, it just acts like a point charge when we're outside. Well, what if we're inside? What if I do r less than r? So I'm going to make my Gaussian surface here inside a little distance r away and we're going to do the same thing we have our surface integral of e dot dA is equal to q enclosed over e naught so the electric field inside times the area of 4 pi r squared where in this case r is less than r is equal to q enclosed over e naught how much charge is enclosed here well, in a charged conductor, all the charge resides on the surface. So there is zero Q enclosed. So the electric field inside a charged conductor at R less than R is equal to zero because this is a conductor. This would not be true if this were an insulator, which is the topic of the next video. So now, just graphically before, before I close this out, if we're looking at a charged conducting sphere, 
The field inside the conductor is zero because all of the excess charge resides on the surface. That doesn't mean there isn't charge enclosed, but it's an equal number of positive and negative, equal number of protons and electrons. All the excess charge is on the surface. So inside, it doesn't matter where I am inside, the electric field is zero because there's no charge enclosed. Outside of my conductor, my electric field decreases as a one over square relationship. So spheres, just like conduct, conducting spheres, are just like point charges. Pretty cool, huh? All right, now, next video, we're going to talk about insulating spheres because those are a lot more fun. So that's all for this one. Looking forward to teaching you some more.